I just feel so strongly that that God wants to say something to somebody in this room. That many of us were, were looking around and, and we're seeing these words, there's, there's no other hope. And we're saying things like just one touch and everything changes. But I feel like there's some pain in this room. Maybe someone's looking around and everybody else is feeling joy and hope because the joy of the Lord is available to us and it is our strength. But maybe there's someone in this room that's looking around and going, man, and even the song we sang before, I am a child of God, and that just brings up maybe a little bit of pain because our earthly father was not there or didn't treat us right. And God just wants to say to you that I will exchange that pain for joy. If you just lift it up to me right now, can you just lift your hands up right now all across this room? And I just want to lead you right now. And, and just between you and God, you just say, if that's you experiencing that pain, God, I just want to exchange my pain for that joy. I want to exchange my pain for that real sense of identity that I am a child of God, that I am chosen, that you will not forsake me. That one touch really can change everything. This is your moment right here. This is your moment. One touch doesn't make everything easy. That's not what the song says. But God can change you right now. Just say that, God, I want you to change me. I give you my pain and I take your joy. In Jesus' mighty name. And can you guys just take a moment and just praise God for that transaction that just happened? God, we give you praise. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amazing. You guys can be seated. Uh, I want to stay in, in a very similar atmosphere. Worship team, that was just incredible. Like, both services. And I'm so excited for what God is going to do here today. And Pastor David was right. If you were here for our 930, uh, you saw, you saw the power of God fall. Yeah, let's give it up for those speakers one more time. I'm equally as excited to be able to uh, introduce the first speaker for this service. And I have so much that I could say about Hudson Brown. He's coming. He was playing bass. So he's probably like back there uh, splashing some water in his face. I've known Hudson for so, <laughs> <laughs> all right, come on up, man. I've known Hudson, I've known Hudson for so many years and there are so many things that I could say. This is the first time that I'm like, there's too much. So I'll just let him, I'll just let him speak for himself. Uh, but I'm so proud of you, Hudson. Uh, I remember the first time I heard you and your, your gift come out of you for speaking, because people know you as a worshiper, but you have, you have another gift. I heard you, and, and I just remember feeling the weight of, of God's presence uh, fall when you, when you spoke. And you guys are going to see some, you guys have already seen amazing things but you guys are going to continue to see amazing things from Hudson Brown. Can you guys give it up one more time? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Hudson. Uh, as you know, I like to play bass up here, and uh, I like to serve on the worship team. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I've been in this church since I was quite literally in the womb. I'm sure you all, you all, you all know my parents from forever. Um, but uh, so today I was going to talk about something that's really close to my heart. And I don't know if you know me, but I'm really introverted and I'm quiet. So if any of you ever talk to me and I just seem completely uninterested, I'm so sorry. That's, 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 it's me, not you. Don't worry about it. But, but uh, so because of that, today I want to talk about something that is quite common in the Bible, and it's about love. So turn with me to 1 John 4, starting in verse 16. 
and I'll skip ahead in a second, but this just said, verse 16 just says, God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. And then, that's our first one, but we can skip ahead for a second. And then it goes, if we skip ahead to uh, verse 19, it says, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. Whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So if we take this from, you know, Bible, old language, and put it in something that we can understand more today, it says, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. So in the Bible, it puts not loving people equates you to being a liar. In other places in the Bible, it equates being a liar to equate to mean being a murderer in other places, but I won't go to that. Anyway, <laughs> point is we have to love people. I'm not going to get too intense here. But <laughs> anyway, so how this relates to me is that since I'm so quiet sometimes, um, a few years ago, I didn't really, I, I didn't have a lot of friends a lot. So like, I mean, raise your hand if you love every, everyone, like everybody, you love everyone. See, sure, but anyway, that's beside the that. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> anyway, now, how many of you don't like me? Don't raise your hands. But I mean, <laughs> but the point, the point of this is that whatever community we go in, there are going to be people that we do not like, and there are going to people be people that don't like us. And even though we don't like someone, we have to still love them. I saw this thing on social media once that said, can you just like someone and still love them? And, uh, and the first comment was, do you have any siblings? But anyway. That was, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> even, the, even the people that we dislike, see, there's a long list of things that bother me. Like, it, it's long. Everything bothers me, and it's hard to deal with. But even the people that get on my nerves so much, I still love them, because I have to. You know? <laughs> It's the Bible, what am I going to say? <laughs> so, even in that, I still have to love. So we have this whole problem in us that it's hard for us to love each other, and it's hard for us to love people. So for that, I'd like to turn with me to one more verse. I've got a lot of verses. This is Matthew twenty-two thirty-four. I want to say, I think, yeah. So it's, uh, this section is entitled, The Greatest Commandment. It says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So if you pay specific attention at the end, it says all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So if you get nothing out of what I say today... Basically, Jesus is saying, this is what the entire Bible paraphrased in the two sentences look like. Love the, God, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the truth is, we don't know love if we don't love God before we love each other. Because it says God is love. So it denies God's very nature to not be able to love us. And if he loves us, we can't not love each other. Because it even says in the Bible, Adam and Eve, God created Eve for Adam because we need each other to survive. If we don't have each other, we're not, it says, I can, Paul says, I can have faith that can move mountains. No matter how good I am at bass or no matter how good I am at talking in front of a bunch of people that are older and twice as smart as me, it doesn't matter if I have a 200 IQ. If I don't love, I am nothing. I, can, I can't be any, I can't be, we can't be anything if we don't love each other because I would, a few years ago, I was nothing because I didn't love anyone. I disliked a lot of people, and if I'm being honest, I hated some people, but I loved no one. <laughs> and that's why, that's why my life was miserable, <laughs> because I didn't love anybody, and we have to love people. We have to love each other. If we're not close to anyone, what do we do? We can't live our lives alone. That's not how it works. <laughs> we just can't do that. So, in essence, all the Bible is saying is love God and love each other. And if you think about it a lot, if you think about the most common image we think about when we think of Jesus, which is a cross, it's really just, you can think of it as ver vertical and horizontal. So God loves us, now we have to love each other. If, we, if God doesn't love us first, then we can't love each other. And if we don't love God, then we can't love each other. It says God is love. God is the only source of love in our lives. So if you don't love God, 
You can't love anyone because you can't give something that you don't have. So, in essence, we have to love each other or else we're nothing. <laughs> no, no one said it better. No one said it better besides the apostle. So pray with me before we close out. Uh, Father God, we just uh, come before you today, and I pray for anyone in this room who struggles with loving people or loving, loving you, and I pray that you would just uh, take that doubt out of their mind, and I pray that they would be able to love you and that we could love each other with all our hearts. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. This is the man who loves the word of God, and he loves the Lord who gave that word. And that's why, bro, everything that you said is reaching the hearts right now, and it's going to multiply into their lives and multiply through them, bro. Thank you for doing the work, man. Thank you. Seriously. You got to be excited about what's happening here. Look at this, you guys. You got the people. These are the future leaders of our community and the church of God and the world. I mean, just listen to their hearts. I mean, the words are great, but, man, when you hear the heart and you know that that's God's heart, it's unstoppable. I'm excited. Anyway, guys, Michaela Ortiz, girl, come on up here. Just come up here. I, I love this girl. The reason I love her, I mean, I love everybody, you know what I mean, and in that way that God gives us. But I have a genuine affection for her because I've seen her come into our community, and I've seen her show the heart of God that is inside of her to the people around her. Now, she's like, she's kind of like a, a, a volcano. And this is what I mean, because if you're around her, you see that she's a little bit quiet. But you talk to her for five minutes, and you just see that there is something bubbling up inside there. And you're going to get a piece of it right now. So I don't need to talk at all into your ear. So, all right, you ready? I'm ready. Good morning, my not-so-early risers. <laughs> I'm Michaela, as John said. And today I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit of my testimony and just how I've come to embrace my identity as a child of God. Um, now a little backstory. I grew up in a non-religious household raised by a single mom, and I was a daddy's girl to a father who was just never really around. I suffered from, with abandonment issues. I had trust issues, and I had this be prepared for the worst mentality, and to top it off, I had a tendency to internalize literally everything. And I always wanted to be somebody else to, to be accepted so that people would stay, but it left me empty and a stranger to myself. From ages 11 to 20, I had, I, had, I had come to hate myself so much that I was self-harming to cope with the emotional pain I felt I couldn't express to my family or peers. <sighs> now, I'm sure you're all mostly familiar with the story where Jesus walks on water. Now, if you don't, the disciples are in a boat, they're in the middle of the storm, and Jesus is coming up to them, and they think he's a ghost, but he's not. Uh, so what I find interesting is, despite being in the middle of a, of a storm, Peter cries out to Jesus in Matthew 14, 28, saying, Lord, if it is you, command me to walk to you on the waters. Now, notice he doesn't just ask for Jesus to change his circumstances. Instead, he, he, he asks to experience a move of God. He, he doesn't he doesn't ask for Jesus to just call the sea to still, even though he's done it before. He wants something different. He wants something new. He steps out in faith, believing that what lies beyond this boat is safer and so much greater than where he currently is. <laughs> he steps out of the boat like a child taking his first steps towards the Father, knowing that the arms outstretched to receive him will be there to catch him whether he sinks or swims. Now, about a year ago, a friend's faith had shown me a light and a love I didn't know God had to offer. He showed me Jesus in the middle of my storm. Now, I remember crying out in desperation to God, saying, Lord, if you're even real, if you're who this friend says you are, help me, because I can't do this anymore. I want it out of my boat. And sure enough, he didn't call me as I stand here before you out of the boat. He called out the child in me that I had forgotten about, the child in me that I had given up on, the child in me full of hope and love and dreams before the world made her heart hard, the child in me who never thought she was enough. And he said, you are seen, you are enough, you are loved, and more than that, you are mine. <laughs> And you don't need to hide in the darkness anymore. 
Now, not so ironically, the first message I heard here posed the question, who is Jesus to you? And after a year of allowing God to tear down the walls that I had built and breathe life back into my life, I think in figuring out who Jesus is to me, I desperately needed to know who I am to Jesus. Now, I am no longer a slave to my circumstances. My identity is not defined by the mistakes I've made nor the hardships I've faced. I am not a slave to shame or the labels I've taken on because of it. I am not a coward, too afraid to speak up for herself. I am not toxic. I am not a burden. I am not better off dead. <laughs> I am a child, a beloved child of God, a child of light, not of darkness. And Jesus is the father, the parent even, that I've always needed. He's emotionally available and faithful to keep his promises. He holds my healing in his hands. The scars on his resurrected body not only say, I have already won your war, but I understand your pain and I am here. I have been here holding you close even before you'd open my eyes to see me. Now, if there's anyone here suffering from depression, suicidal thoughts, or thinks they're too broken to be loved or accepted, I want you to know that there's a God who sees more than where you're at, who sees that child and God who he's always created you to be. Notice he... He, the, he, he comes to the disciples on the boat before they even ask him. He, and and he, he's faithful. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Just come. In all your brokenness and all your shame and all of your imperfections, just come to him, and he will turn all of that darkness, all of that pain into something so much greater, something you couldn't even imagine. I couldn't have even imagined that he would take such a broken person and put me on this stage. Like, I think when Peter sinks a little later, he didn't doubt, doubt Jesus. I, didn't, I don't think he necessarily doubted who he was, but he doubted that he was a child of God. And I want you to know that you are all children of God, and his arms are open and waiting. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so I really feel like um, I really feel like God has incredible leadership for you, um, and I and I think that like I just kept on looking up and and I'm just gonna be honest like I kept on hearing pastor. Um, I don't know if that's what you want, but I think that's something that's available to you. God has mighty plans for you. God has incredible plans for you. And I think, I think that he's going to take that pain and make it your platform. That was awesome. Thank you, Michelle. That was awesome. I'm shook. Um, okay. Who's saved? <laughs> Who, like, just got saved? <laughs> All right. Um, this next speaker is someone who's very special to me and to Pastor April and to our whole reality community. And uh, I'm just so proud of this young lady uh, because everything that you hear, um, it comes from her, the way she lives her life. She is, she is such a great example. Not that she's perfect, nobody is. But man, like she lets God use her. 
And uh, I could not be more thrilled that you guys get to hear from Maddie Bravo. You guys give it up. Good morning, Gateway. So I have a quick question to start off like our time together here. So in the past week, by a show of hands, how many of you guys had a great day? Like, God is good, but man, he was extra good that day. Yeah? All right. And then another question. Same week, how many of you guys have experienced, like, a harder day? Maybe some issues at work, at school, um, family things? Yeah? Okay. I know some of you guys probably didn't raise your hands because you're shy. But I know that we all go through this because um, we're human, you know? And then we know for a fact that, you know, God is good. But our flesh loves to go against that belief when things get rough. And um, so that's, like, what I'm going to be talking to you about today. When things get tough, you know, when we're faced with a problem, we always not necessarily question God, but we kind of doubt him. We know he has a plan for us, but we're always like, um, God, like, <laughs> what's going on right here? Like, can you, like, just come, touch it, fix it, please? But, <laughs> but, um... And it kind of reminds me of the Israelites. So I know a lot of us are familiar with the stories, but for those of us that aren't, here's a like, little 30-second recap. So the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt for about 400 years, which is a long time. So then God sends Moses to free them, yet the Pharaoh was like, hmm, hmm, not right now. No. So then God performs many miracles that plagued Egypt, and, but nothing worked, till the very last one where he sent the angel of death, killing the firstborn in every household, including the Pharaoh's son. And then the Pharaoh, he let the Israelites go, and the Israelites left to the desert. But the Pharaoh was so mad that he had lost his son that he ended up getting an army and going after them and planning to kill them. And this takes us to the desert right now, where the Israelites are super happy until, like, you know, they turn around and the Pharaoh's right there with an army. But um, we see this in Exodus 14, 10 through 11. Um, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us out? You brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? And it's kind of crazy, you know. God just performed so many miracles to free them. He just showed them. And yet, like, at the first look of trouble, they doubt him. They doubt God's promise. You know, God promised them a land full of milk and honey, a promised land. And yet... When they see something, like, they saw the pharaohs, they got scared. And it's kind of like um, they were going from Egypt to the promised land, but they were in the middle. They were in the middle of a promise, in the middle of a storm. And oftentimes when we're in the middle of something, we don't hear God's voice clearly. And we just think that, you know, the beginning was better. Even though we were struggling, that it's better than right now. And because the end seems too far away. The end seems impossible to get there. It can't possibly get better. But you know what? We serve a God who with him, everything is possible. Nothing with him is impossible. And he, and he, he knows everything, you know. He's an all-knowing God. He knows it before it happens. We even see in the Bible, that same chapter, a few verses up in Exodus 14.4, Pharaoh says, um, this is God talking to Moses. Pharaoh will think um, the Israelites are lost. They're confused. The wilderness has closed in on them. Then I'll make Pharaoh's heart stubborn again, and he'll chase after them. And I'll use Pharaoh and his army to put my glory on display. Then the Egyptians will realize that I am God, and that's what happened. Yeah. And you see, you know, God, was, God knew that Pharaoh was going to go before Pharaoh knew he was going to go. <laughs> So for those of you that don't know the end of the story, you know God saved the Israelites. He helped Moses part the sea. And we have this amazing story to turn back to. But can you imagine that if the Israelites didn't go through this experience, they would not have not experienced the freedom they were um, given, promised by God. They would have not been in that promised land. And we also see this as God using the Israelites, how God uses us. You know, he took them through this experience in this rough journey and through the Israelites, he was able to show himself to the Egyptians, the ones that were not saved, the ones that did not know who he was. And, you know, God sees everything. Nothing with him goes unnoticed. He sees all our pain, all our struggles. You know, he allows us to go through some of these harder things, but it's okay because these, each experience, each hardship that we go through, it allows us to be in a position 
where God is able to refine us, to reposition us, to make us better. And everything that we have gone through, it has made us into who we are today and to be able to show other people of who he is. And every pain and hurt, it has a purpose. It's to show off God's glory. It may hurt right now, but God turns that pain and that hurt to something beautiful. And then the things you have in learned, again, have a purpose. It may not be for right now, but maybe in a year you are able to help and relate to somebody and they're able to see God through you because you have probably gone through the same situation. But if they can see that, you know, if God did that with them, then God can do the same with me. And, or it can allow you to relate to a certain type of people, to have a heart and be able to understand. And the thing we must wrap our like, heads around is that we are living being of God's glory, his endless love and limitless mercy. So today, I want to pray for the people who are stuck in the middle right now and for the people that feel like the end is too far away. So with everybody's heads bowed, um, I just pray right now. Dear Heavenly Father, right now, I just pray for everybody that's stuck in the middle, everybody that can't find an end, God. I pray that you give them a strength, God, a supernatural strength to push forward, God, to find you in the middle of the storm, God. I pray a hope and a peace that surrounds them, God, that allows them to get through the situation, God, that they are able to find and their strength in you, God, and not with the things around them, God, that they take this experience as a learning experience, that they are able to be refined by you and have open hearts to you, God. In your name I pray, amen. Maddie. You are such a gifted, I mean, I'm just stating the obvious. You are such a gifted communicator. I'm sure you already know. I'm sure this isn't the first time you've heard it, but this is the first time I've seen you. So maybe I'm just the one who's behind the curve here. But, girl, you've got a speaking anointing on you. And I am personally blessed by you stand up here and you bring the word of God to the people with this confidence. And it's a confidence that clearly comes from God. And that is such a blessing. And it just causes you to speak and just to get that out. And it's just God flowing through you. You've blessed a lot of people today. That's just the tip of the iceberg. You know that, right? Thank you, Maddie. Thank you. Speaking of the tip of the iceberg, Daniel Adams, you guys. Daniel Adams. Yes, that's what I'm saying right there. If you guys know him, if you know this guy at all, and you know that this is a heart that is on fire for, the, for God. It's a heart that's on fire for his people. And it's a heart that's on fire to bring that fire to you so that you can have that ignited in your heart and so that it can go out. You're going to hear a great thing right now. And I'm going to move this thing again like I did in the first service because you're going to get a little action here. But like Pastor David said, I mean, this isn't, for, this isn't for entertainment. You know what I'm saying? I mean, being entertained, let's have a good time for goodness sakes. But this is about the serious heart of God and it's going to come through. And Lord, we just thank you for your anointing here, and I just want to see it go. So today I want to I wanna share on the prodigal son. Um, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to tell it to you. Uh, there's this son who, um, he gets his father's inheritance, and he goes out in the world, and he blows it. He just um, throws it all away, and there's a famine, and uh, he's he's starving, and he, he finds himself um, he finds himself working uh, feeding pigs, and he finds himself as he's feeding these pigs, just like, man, I have no food, and even in my father's house, the servants ate, and so he preps up, you know, his his message that he wants to tell his dad as he returns, and he says, um, you know. I'm not worthy to be your son, but maybe if you would take me in as a hired servant. And I feel like that's what a lot of us do. I don't care if this is your first time in church or if you're a pastor here, um, but, but sometimes, uh, sometimes we make it about our service to God. And, and sometimes we, 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 we let go of the fact that we're a child of God and we try to serve for this thing. We try to, we try to earn this thing. Um, 
And so uh, in verse 20 of, of Luke 15, uh, it says, And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And, and sometimes, sometimes we feel like this son, that, uh, that we, have to, we have to earn our way back to the father. And we're walking back knowing that, man, he gave me everything I had and I threw it all away. And now I have to return to him and we walk in shame and in guilt and of self-condemnation and in self-hatred. And we're burdened and we're walking like this, dragging our feet to God. But while you're still a long way off, God sees you and he loves you and he runs out to you because he loves you that much. And you can't earn this thing. You can't serve for this thing. This isn't something that you can get for, for yourself by, by working for it. You have to let go and let God give it to you. He, he, he gives you this gift and you receive it by just taking it. I've always been kind of like a, a, a hard worker. I like to earn my thing. And, and one time Pastor April shared a word with me. And she said, Daniel, I see a fountain, and I see you're trying to climb to the top because the water's flowing from the top, but you're slipping. And, and I want to let you know that God is not coming out of the top. He's in the waters below. And you said, let go and fall into God's love. And that, that, that changed my life, that word you, you gave to me. Um, it's so much bigger than, than us earning this thing. It's about God's love for us. Our, our love for God doesn't change his love for us. It's, it's his love for us that changes us. And, and it's crazy. I, I, I've, I've seen miracles that God has done. Um, I couldn't walk as a kid, and they said I would never walk again. And now I'm walking, and I'm running, and I'm jumping. And, and, and I, I, I was depressed for years, and I didn't tell a single soul. And, and I, was, I, was, uh, I tried to take my life at 11 years old, and the knife didn't go through. God, God has seen me. He's, he's, I needed freedom. He gave me freedom. I needed healing. He gave me healing. But the greatest miracle of all time is that a perfect father, that a perfect counselor, a perfect king, a perfect savior will look down at someone like me, and he would say, I love you. And that's the love that God has for you. It's not something you can earn. It's something you have to fall into. And I can't, let a single, I can't let a single person walk out of here not knowing the love that God has for them. <laughs> See, I believe, I believe God loves you so much that he would cross any mountain. He'd cross any ocean. He'd break down any wall. He'd spend as much time with you as he needs because he loves you. This is going to sound crazy, but I believe God loves you so much that he would even die for you. And this son, he didn't have to fix everything together to be able to come back to his father. He didn't have to. Sometimes I think we, have, we feel like, oh, I have to get it together. I have, to, I have to fix it all to come back to God. When really it's like, if you come back to God, he'll fix it. And the only thing you have to do is, it's this thing, scary word for the church. It's called repentance. And it's, it's when you see where you're at and you say, I don't want to be here. I want to be over there. What am I doing here? And you, you're looking at where you're at. You're, you're, you're eating with the pigs. You're sliding around in the mud, and you're like, this is not where I'm supposed to be. This is not who I was born of. And you say, this is not where I'm going to be. I'm going to turn around. That's what repentance is. You turn from the broken and follow God. So I have one question. This is the... <laughs> The only thing that really matters, the only thing that's true, I grew up in church, and I didn't, I didn't know the love that God had for me, and I was burdened. The gospel isn't made to better us, it's made to transform us. And when I met God's love, um, everything shifts. Everything changes. Everything changes. And like I said, I don't care if this is your first time here or you've been here 20 years. You have to know God's love. You have to have a revelation of who he is and how he sees you because you'll never know who you are until you know whose you are. <laughs> that you're a child of a king. So I have one question. Are you ready to stop trying for this thing and trying to earn it? 
Are you ready to come back home and fall back into the arms of a loving father? Because he's waiting for you. The father was there waiting for his son to return each and every morning. The reason why the father saw him when he was a long ways off is because he was watching. He was waiting for his son to return. So God, just have everyone close their eyes, um, bow their heads, or whatever way you want to pray with me. I just, Heavenly Father, um, God, I'm a sinner. God, I'm broken. God, I don't know how to do this anymore. I don't know how to do this by myself. And God, I give up. I give up trying to, I give up trying to do this by myself. I give up. God, I give up and I step into who you are for me. You're a good God, and I'm a broken sinner, and yet you love me. And you'll never forget me. You'll never forsake me, and I'm a child. I want to be a child again. I want to have that joy. I want to have that faith. I want to believe in what you tell me. I want to believe what you, what you say about me, who you tell me that I am. That's who I want to be. I want to be a child of a, of a perfect father, of a good father. Jesus, I need you. Yeah. what you already did God um, you're so good yeah, Lord. you're so good to us Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God you know you know my heart you know that I'm still broken on the inside you know that I still hide stuff God and God I thank you that you don't leave me there God that you try to pull it out of me and you try to break it down God you don't leave me where I'm at God you receive me with open arms. Jesus, I need you. I need you so much. Thank you, Jesus. You, God. Thank you for what you did for me. <laughs> and in your name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Daniel Adams, come on. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. I don't want to, but we're going to close this service and you can be seated. Very special. How many received something tremendous today? I know that as Daniel prayed for you, I know there were many decisions that were made right there in those chairs, many rededications. Many of you came to Christ. I'd love to know about that. I'd love to hear from you. In a few minutes, the service is going to close. We're going to receive our offering, and you have a chance to communicate with us in a couple of ways. Let us know what God has done in your life. If you would like to, we'd love to hear about it. There's a card in front of you that says, I've decided. I think if you made a decision for Christ today, it would be amazing to know about it. Put it down on that card and drop it in the offering as it comes by. We'd love to hear. I know these guys would love to hear the impact that they had. And I believe there was impact. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you to all you guys that shared. I know. Uh, I, I'm a father. I know there's some proud fathers and moms in this. I know there's some proud pastors in this room. And proud elders and leaders and uh, proud of each and every one of you. And uh, I just want to say, Michaela, you talked about your dad kind of missing some of your life. I, I had two sons that I'm super proud of, but if I'd have had a daughter, I would have wanted her to be just like you. And you're a daughter in this house. And you know what, Gateway? These young people, they're your sons and daughters. These are your sons and daughters and I want, you to, I want you to embrace them and, and receive them and cheer for them because that's what our church is all about, to see all people raised up to be used of God. All right, I'm going to stop talking. We're going to let the ushers serve you. We're going to go out today with 
worship. Stick around for a moment as you give. Thank you for your giving. Just receive the blessing of the Holy Spirit as the worship team comes. I'll be back in just a moment to speak a blessing over you as you leave. guys. You can see some of our young people. They're here to uh, pray for you. If you need prayer, if you need healing prayer, believe God. We'll believe God with you and we'll believe that you'll be healed. If you need to chat with somebody, connect with them. If you just want to say great job, come up and connect with them. If you're interested in being a part of the youth ministry, we're growing and you can see why. So there are openings on the youth team. If you want to see Pastor Jordan, Pastor April, find out what they're looking for in a youth worker. Somebody that can just make hot dogs sometimes is a real blessing. What College as well. We, we have openings in college and, and uh, young adults. So check out with, uh, with our leaders, John and others that are happening, that are involved in young adults and, and um, youth. All right? Let me just speak a blessing over you guys. Will you lift your hands? All right, I'm going to pitch you catch. Thank you, Father, for your blessing. Let your grace, real and strong, drop down on every heart, empowering us to live a different kind of life. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. I love each and every one of you. God bless you. You are dismissed.